Hi, hello and welcome. So for today's video, to keep things interesting and prevent repeating too much, I'll be focusing more on late game content and the content that I just hadn't seen in my different runs of Fear and Hunger. I hadn't beat Sylvian, so to get footage for this video, I did a Terror and Starvation run to the Void to fight her and experience it firsthand. For no particular reason, I thought it'd be cool to use all four of the playable characters. Thanks to the subreddit and the wiki.gg, as always, for being a resource. So let's get started on today's list of 20 more nasty things in Fear and Hunger 1. Starting off with one, the mumbler, the mumbler and its design. Continuing the theme of Fear and Hunger's experimentation with horror that draws on body horror, let's talk about the mumbler. I don't think I need to censor these guys, but where the design draws inspiration from is pretty obvious. Another example of transposing genital imagery onto the denizens of the dungeon, another layer of horror that is the Fear and Hunger experience. I thought the mumblers were particularly annoying, but the normal variants aren't too much of a threat. Found in the thicket, they can be mostly easy to avoid by using the multiple paths through the different levels of the thicket. If engaged in combat, their damage and HP isn't too high. If talked to, they don't reply. Their head will spew poison at the party if attacked. Poisoning is the main threat that the mumbler will present. Nothing in the thicket or the lore seems to indicate that they can form groups or society. They just seem like empty-minded abominations. A variant of the mumbler can be found that poses a greater threat and thus show some signs of intelligence, the greater mumbler. The community discussion on Reddit and the wiki section for the lore of the great mumbler suggests that the mumblers are followers of the god of the depths. Like other followers, they are either insects or beings that are quote, forsaken and forgotten, that fulfill some task in the dungeon assigned to them by the god of the depths. The greater mumbler poses a more serious threat and can be easily identified by the ringing of the bells that they are carrying. In one hand, they carry a bell that if rung will drain mind and a green sacky thing that the mumbler can use to burn you. Fortunately, intelligent application of damage can render him mostly harmless with some luck in the first turn. So between the design of the mumblers, their odd lore, and dedication to the god of the depths, along with their relatively minor yet very real threat they present, I wanted to start today's list with the mumblers. Moving on to the cave mother. One of the only early game creatures on today's list, we have the cave mother. She can be found fairly early on in the game by taking the elevator down to the level 4 caverns. She is what has spawned all the little cave gnomes flying around the last two levels of the dungeon. If the player approaches a certain ledge on this level, they will hear the flapping of wings descending and approaching the party, prompting phase one of the fight against her. Taking out her wings, she will start to fall and give the impression that the fight is over. Before the party is able to walk far from the cave mother encounter, the party will be charged by the now wingless cave mother, triggering the second phase of the encounter. Finishing the fight with the cave mother gives the option of searching her body, from which the party can retrieve the gnome egg. Not far from this encounter, a second cave mother can be found chained to the cavern walls. We don't know why or get any indication how she ended up there, but seeing how she's chained up and secreting yellow ooze, it's a safe guess that someone is harvesting her. Number 3. The Skin Granny Making it to Mahabre, ascending the long stairs up to the Tower of the Endless. If the player attempts to rest and save, the flashback sequences will be triggered. These flashbacks 
flesh out the motivations and the history of the main characters. The last one we see is the tragic events that befell Rag and his village in Odengard. Entering the only visible structure that we are led to by a trail of blood and bodies, the party will encounter the Skin Granny. Initially appearing as a harmless old lady, she'll grant the party one free action to prepare for the fight as she mutates to her true form. The new gods tell us about the Skin Granny, a myth passed on by the wild men of the north and those who live in Odengard and its surrounding areas. The myth is typically told to new generations as a cautionary tale on what happens if you abandon your family and leave for greener pastures. The black is said to creep from the dark corners of your home cabin, slowly nibbling the form of your beloved ones. The creature is of course just a myth, but the tale lives on strong in the consciousness of the northern folk, and often in nightmares, the creature has a vivid presence. The new gods when asked about the skin granny. The new gods suggest the skin granny manifest when one leaves their family to look for greener pastures. Perhaps her presence is making a statement on Rags traveling to Vinland, where him and his countrymen found a cube of the depths that triggered a shit show that is the events of fear and hunger. The skin granny's main threat is her ability to use her multiple arms to try to cut the player. Fortunately, you will have one free turn at the beginning of the encounter to cast buffs or status effects. With some luck, this encounter can be fairly straightforward but still unsettling due to the design and name of the skin granny. The Cave Dwellers The Cave Dwellers are the inhabitants of the only population center or town in the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger. Blue skinned in appearance and muscular and rock hard in description, the cave dwellers live in the village beneath the mines and they guard the cube of the depths which started the decay that has spread through the dungeon. The cave dwellers got the cube of the depths by trading provisions with a desperate Captain Rudimer whose mental state was already in decay. The cave dweller village also has one of the few merchants in the game that would trade for the silver coins the player has been picking up throughout the dungeon. Initially peaceful, the cave dwellers are not aggressive at first towards the player. From Darcy we hear, I found this underground village full of those things. They live in savage ways. They are but a pack of heretics, the things they did to me. When I got to see one of their primitive rituals, I had to step in. I cut down a couple of them, and then they chased me here. If the player stops the attack on Darcy, or takes the cube of the depths, the entire village will aggro and start hunting the player on sight. Though they are strong and muscular, fortunately they are unarmored. Taking out their arm that is holding a weapon will usually render them harmless in a fight, making it easy to run in and grab the cube and then fight your way out of the village. Another way of triggering an aggressive response from the cave dwellers is to interrupt this couple from, well, interrupt them from what they are currently doing. Not sure why you want to, but hey. According to the wiki, on any playthrough, there is a 10% chance that the player will find the village of cave dwellers massacred and the village will be patrolled by moonless guards instead. If the player is traveling to Mahabra, you should be sure to grab the rope and use it to descend to a wolf mass orgy and then to level 7 of the catacombs where you can find the ancient door. Number 5. The Cockroach King A little known servant of the god of the depths can be found hidden in the thicket if on the first level the player pushes their way into a series of secret doors in the walls they will be able to drop down a level and have an audience with the Cockroach King. You are able to speak with him if you have the mastery over insect skills. He will call you a filthy human and demand that you kneel before him. If you play along, he will give you an opportunity to serve him and move up in the ranks and he gives you the title of peasant. The Cockroach King gives you the task of going to the surface and killing the butterfly at his request. He mentions that they cannot allow him to finish his metamorphosis and fly away with butterfly wings. Completing this task moves the player up in rank to a noble and increases affinity with the god of the depths. Completing the second task to kill a visitor to the dungeon who has long hair and is a priest of destruction will move the player further up into the ranks of whatever the cockroach king is king of and will increase affinity with the god of the depths once more. The cockroach king then mentions that 
His people have always wanted a new flesh of a home that has magical powers. I don't think Enki would approve. All right, next on our list is our Lord and Savior, Almer. One of the things I like in games is when secrets hold further secrets, waiting for a curious player to come by and find them. In the tunnel area that leads from the bottom of the dungeon to Mahabre, there is a three-part puzzle that I call the Push Blue Statues onto Gold Square puzzle. Clever, I know. Solving it will open a non-assuming door that leads to the Tomb of the Gods, a modest location housing the body of none other than Almer the Ascended, the messianic figure in the religion of the world of fear and hunger. Almer was born a regular person in the city of Jataya. He eventually became a Christ-like religious figure, leading 12 apostles who would spread his teachings. He eventually upset the powers that be and was crucified. Upon dying, he ascended to divinity in Mahabra and was able to resurrect. In a deviation from the traditional Christ story, he came back and took revenge on the kings and Pharisees that condemned him. His body can be found in the ancient tomb in the Tomb of the Gods. There's no real gameplay purpose to his body being found here other than lore and ambiance, but there is one fun interaction. If the player has the necromancy skill available to them, they will get the option to use the necromancy on the old god. A coin flip is then triggered to see if the spell is successful. As always, it's whenever I'm recording that I get crazy odds and never get the coin flip that I need. But nevertheless, I persisted until the necromancy spell was cast and several bottles of vodka and ale have been consumed. Not a bad time, I guess. The only effect that the necromancy spell has is to revive a part of Almer, his, how should I put this, his equipment or package after casting the spell. It seems like Almer is happy to see you or he has something in his pocket. So yeah, that's in the game. Unique if nothing else. I've never seen a game where you can get a god at wrecked. Let me know in the comments if you can think of any other games that lets you get god hard. The Lady of the Moon Next door to where Almer can be found, in the Tomb of the Gods, there is a door behind which we'll find several Manebas, servants of the moon god Rare, the jellyfish-like creatures that are encountered in the first levels of the dungeon. Past these moon servants, we find another type of moon-loving jellyfish, the Lady of the Moon. The Lady of the Moon will rise out of the green hue in the corner of the room and a battle sequence will initiate, but the Lady will not attack. If you use the talk skill, more of her intents and purposes can be learned. If you ask her about her origin, she says that she comes from the green. If you ask her who she is, she says that she's a servant of the moon god, Rare. She mentions that like the moon god, she doesn't believe that humans should have the same rights as gods. If the little girl is in the party, she will offer you a trade. If you give her the smallest one among your party, the lady will heal the wounds of the party and make everyone whole, reversing any dismemberment or physical damage to the members of the party. Like another creature of rare, Pocket Cat, the Lady of the Moon is trying to stop any human of divine origin from ascending to godhood, so that they may never rival the powers of the moon god rare or the old gods. Number 8. The White Angel and His Splitting Attack Walking the alleyways of Mahabra in the past, approaching the Tower of Torment, we'll see these white figures that appear to have been cut open at the chest and chained to the wall. Initially inert, after defeating the Torment of Soul, you'll notice that they are gone while their chains remain. From here on in, several white angels can be found roaming the alleyways of past Mahabra. They are a very real threat since they use both of their sharp wings to attack the party, but the real threat comes from their coin flip attack, where they would jump into the air and come down on one of the party members with full force and weight, cleaving a party member clean in half with a single strike. In the attempts to reason with the White Angel, or learn more about them by talking, are futile, since the White Angel would not reveal any information to you. Fortunately, dealing with a White Angel grants the White Angel Soul, which increases a party member's agility to 20, granting it first action in a turn, but also a second extra turn dramatically increasing damage output and survivability for the party. Number 9. The Witch The first time most players will encounter the Witch will be at the beginning of the game, when the Witch briefly teleports the player to another realm. If the player is quick, they can escape this little pocket dimension 
and make their way back to the dungeon without fighting the witch. Fighting the witch at this time is generally a poor idea since the player will not have the party or equipment to take her down. The Black Witch is a servant of Grogoroth, like the Black Priest. Having sowed its soul to the blood arts long ago, the witch lets us know that it's devoted to the point of not fearing death. Fortunately, you can fulfill this and pay back the witch later on in the game. If you're playing on terror and starvation mode, the witch can later be found at the Grand Library in the present. But now, the party should have a fuller party and better equipment. If the player approaches one of the red ritual circles, the witch will appear and charge the party triggering a fight. With some luck and good gear, here, the player can take revenge on the witch for every time the witch taunted you as you started a new run and entered a dungeon and were teleported to the witch's pocket dimension. The Lizard Mages The Lizard Mage is one of the last threats the player will face on their journey to the God of Fear and Hunger. Only found in the Gauntlet, they will attack the player and their party as they make their way through the final floor of the dungeon. The new gods tell us an act of love between the lizard man and the yellow mage. The being that came from the act seems to share the intelligence of both worlds. However, it does not know for certain which tribe it belongs to. Thus, it wanders the darkness alone. The lizard mage will appear in combat armed with a sword that can slash and dismember the party members and a staff that can use to cast Locust Swarm on the party. I think the Lizard Mage belongs on the list of nasty things, if for no other reason than the thought of a marriage ritual between the Yellow Mage and the Lizard Man. But each their own, I guess. Lizard love, what can I say? <laughs> the Double Crow Mauler In my last video of Fear and Hunger, we covered the Crow Mauler, so for the follow-up, I thought we should talk about the Double Crow Mauler. Like the regular Crow Mauler, he is an intimidating sight. Armed with a Mauler, like the original, but now with two heads that can potentially deal out twice as many peck attacks. He is found if you fall down through a hole in the floor while navigating the traps in the gauntlet. Defeating him gives us the Crow Emblem key, which is redundant at this point since you can't leave the gauntlet, and also the Captain's Diary number 3, which details Captain Rudimer's descent into madness as he kept seeing visions of crows and started slipping more and more into the darkness. As far as I can tell, there's no real lore reason as to why there'd be a double-headed crow modder in the bottom of the dungeon, but hey, it does make for a cool endgame enemy. As you can see on screen, the two biggest threats to the crow modder, its ability to do a one-hit kill using the peck attack and the ability to blind the player using the swarm of crow attacks. Since we're already talking about the gauntlet, number 12 on our list is the traps in the gauntlet. So this one might just be me wanting to rant. But either way, I don't think it's a stretch to say that the traps in the gauntlet are nasty. Especially if you imagine how they would operate in real life. I mean, swinging blades, spikes rising from the floor, farting statues are all menacing and gruesome in their own right. In particular, the swinging blades gave me trouble at first. For some reason, my brain just farted out, trying to get the timing right. But practice a few times and it's simple enough. Also, it seems to be a trend that the last areas in a Fear and Hunger game will have insta-death traps. Kind of like the flaming Bremen soldiers in Termina. Another factor in the ickiness of the gauntlet is the insect-covered floors, similar to Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which scarred me psychologically as a child. As you move around the level, you'll hear the chittering of the insects and take small bits of damage from the floor that is completely covered in a swarm of bugs. For some reason, that thought just really stays with me and gets under my skin anytime I'm playing through the gauntlet. Now, moving on to the other endgame area in Fear and Hunger 1, the Void. Starting off with number 13, the Molded. From the new gods, we get the miserable creation that is but a mockery of human beings. It is a simple being created by a new god that once existed who was trying to achieve the power of the older gods with limited understanding. A nasty inhabitant of the Void. The player will encounter these tormented sacks of flesh wandering the lunar surface. Their descriptions from the new gods informed us that they are failed experiments made by those that didn't fully comprehend what they were doing or the power that they were wielding. Attempting to speak to them in combat, you get the message. The creature clearly tries to say something, but its wall of flesh prevents the sound from carrying over. Or, 
Whimpering muffled sounds can be heard from behind the walls of flesh. Inspecting the bodies or mounds of flesh after fighting them yields a description of the smell of sulfur that they leave behind. These tormented beings are a testament to the cost of hubris of new gods meddling with forces they don't understand in order to satisfy their egos and curiosity after ascending on the golden throne. The Blight Before men, the Lizardmen roamed as a dominating life form. Like us, they too desired to ascend higher. What remains of those ancient times are the forms. The new gods, when asked about the Blight, found in the void these eyeless, soft-looking pterodactyls can be found flying across the green hue or perched on top of the rock formations. If the player is trying to record footage for a video on fear and hunger, these creatures will be aware of the fact and leave the player alone, denying the player the opportunity to get footage for a fight. Like so many of the endgame enemies, the blights can pose a threat at first, since the player will spawn into the void after ascending from the golden throne alone with their party scattered. With the HP that they have, it makes it hard to one-shot, but the blight becomes far more manageable once the player has managed to gather their party members. While a serious threat, the blight won't be the creature that makes the player feel the need to run and hide here in the green fog of this otherworldly lunar surface. If you explore the void thoroughly, or just get lucky I guess, you might run into a baby blight. Not much information is available, Presumably, it fell off of a ridge or cliff, since there doesn't appear to be anything to indicate a ground level nest for the Blights. Hitting it doesn't seem to do anything either. The interesting question though is, is this baby Blight a baby lizard man that ascended, or are the Blights in the Void able to reproduce? Number 15, the Greater Blight. In spite of the nasty horrors we've encountered in this video, the undisputed king of the void is the Greater Blight. Like the smaller Blight, the Greater Blight is created when some lizard men, or lizard women I suppose, ascend to godhood. The Greater Blight is a unique enemy that can't be seen on the overview map, but rather it's heard. When exploring the void, the player will get messages such as, you get a primal urge to hide somewhere. The terrifying presence is closing in on you. There is something huge close by in the shadows while being followed with increasingly tense rumbling of footsteps. The player will need to find a hiding spot. If found, the encounter can be skipped as the greater blight fails to find the party. If the player doesn't hide, an unskippable combat encounter starts. The greater blight appears as a giant scaleless T-Rex with no visible eyes. The greater blight is giant, tanky, and imposing, easily wrecking any but the best equipped parties. First, the party will have a few turns as the Great Blight approaches. This is a good time to use abilities like Darcy's fast attack or any other buffs that would help. In these first turns, the Greater Blight is beyond physical attack range, but can still be attacked with magic. Once in range, he will have one arm and two legs that he will attack with. Focusing damage on the limbs can limit the damage your party takes, but if you are able to damage him enough and keep your party alive, he is beatable. Although, you'd be doing it just to do it, since he doesn't drop any rare items or anything else that will motivate you to fight him. So, unless you want a challenge, you're best off hiding when he's close by. Also, fun fact, the sprite looks like it bugged out when I was recording the footage, so at the end, it just looks like we're fighting a flying T-Rex head. I thought that was kind of funny. Sylvian, the biggest threat in the void, only found dwelling in the green hue of this area. These are just the traces of Sylvan, so not the true goddess, but rather a weakened apparition of her that's been left behind with the passage of time. I'm going to be a little bit light on the lore for Sylvan since I've covered this god a few times in my other videos, and I don't want to repeat myself too much, but Sylvian is the god of creation, the antithesis to Grogoroth, the god of destruction. They are both primordial old gods that rule over the world of fear and hunger, representing basic aspects of reality. The god of love and fertility will be found on the path to the new god. She physically appears as a rib cage with a few tentacles and other appendages growing from it. Along with Rare, the machine god, the god of fear and hunger, 
and the traces of Grogoroth, the traces of Sovian, is another god or deity that can be fought and bested by mere mortals, following in the grand tradition of so many JRPGs, in which humans try to kill a god. She will attack with her many tentacles, sapping the party's health. The color of the unknown attack will drain the party's mind, making spells and healing more difficult. And lastly, Sylvian will grow a tumor that over a few turns will take a form of one of the four player characters and start attacking. The Kahara tumor will use critical stab attacks, Darcy's will do leg sweep attacks, Enki's might cast Hurting or Locust Swarm, and Rags will fire Iron Arrows. But if the player is well equipped and you play your cards right, the traces of Sylvian are defeatable. After her traces dissipate, the path to the new Ascended God is unlocked. Number 17. Climbing the Tower of Endless over and over again. So this might be another one of my rants. Ludo narrative cohesion or resonance is something important for a game to really flesh out the vibe, ambiance, or the feel of a game. Meaning that a game should try to have its mechanical themes or challenges reflect the themes and challenges of the narrative. The first Dark Souls did this great, making you feel you were in a vast, dying world mechanically, which is then reinforced with the narrative, setting, and visual themes of the game. Another example of Ludo narrative cohesion is the fucking Tower of the Endless, where you have to climb all the stairs and the loops every time. There isn't a shortcut or an elevator to unlock at the top after climbing up once. Making you climb up and down really makes the player feel and be aware that this tower is tall and, contrary to the name, it is actually endless. But that's a pedantic point. Did you need to trigger the flashback dream sequences to get access to Francois and the Golden Palace? Well, climb to the top of the tower. Oh wait, you're in the wrong time period, so you have to climb back down. Use the beacon of the depths and then climb back up. Okay, you finish the flashback sequence and then climb back down only to realize you forgot the miasma, blue sin, or the eastern sword, or any other item anywhere else in the dungeon. So you climb back up to the top of the tower to use the portal. Okay, now you actually have everything. So you climb back down, but then you forgot to save the game. So you need to climb back up the tower to save the game and then climb back down to continue the game. All I'm saying is that the Tower of the Endless is probably why most of the characters in the game look like they have never skipped leg day with their rock hard glutes and legs. Them butts. Francois and Regret. A lot has already been said about Francois, the dominating soul. In a way, he does kind of serve as the main antagonist. If you could say that Fear and Hunger has a true central antagonist, he is the gatekeeper to the void and all the endings that will lead you there. He serves kind of of a stand-in for the corruption of a person in the pursuit of power. But here's a bit I noticed on my last playthrough that somehow hadn't really stuck out to me about him. To fight him in the past, you must first encounter him in the present. In present Mahabra, he appears as a worn out man who spends his days breeding dogs. Disheveled and emaciated, he's found sitting with his dogs. Time has granted him wisdom and moderation. He talks about the ages past and how he's now aware of his arrogance, how he was presumptuous to assume he'd be able to challenge the old gods, which represent fundamental concepts of reality itself. His dreams of domination were just an illusion. He is nothing more than just another pawn in a long series of pawns in the machinations of the old gods. He now understands the futility of his younger, ambitious self. And now, he is an old man looking back at his foolishness with regret. And who can say they have no regrets looking back? But even the most powerful among us are powerless before time. We can't go back and change the things that we regret. We can only learn to make peace with them and try to move on, if nothing else, as a wiser, more knowledgeable individual. So, the older Francois asks you to go back in time and stop him when he was young. When we encounter him when he's younger, he talks that he only needs a few hundred years to complete his supremacy. But we already know how this plays out. How do you teach something when it seems that only time and experience can do that? I mean, how much did you listen when you were younger? I know I didn't. How much did you have to learn on your own in spite of well-intentioned warnings from others? I know I had to run face first into the wall a few dozen times before I realized I should really start listening to others more. 
But alas, we know that young Francois's mission and ambitions are futile. Aren't most quests for total domination doomed to fail eventually? The King in Yellow The literary figure of the King in Yellow has almost become a trope in survival horror these last few years. Being a prominent theme in both Signalis and Fear and Hunger recently, arguably in Dark Souls as well. I've been fascinated with this figure since hearing about it, a mysterious play about a king that drives anyone insane that reads it. The mystery of the king is almost as alluring as actually knowing about him. The lack of lore and information about him only deepens the mystery. In the game, the king in yellow will only appear if the player assists the guard to his ultimate vain and selfish goal of ascending to godhood. Encountered as a final boss, leading to the sea endings. Canonically, we know that Legard does in fact ascend to godhood and survives the events of Fear and Hunger 1. He then proceeds to spend hundreds of years working in the shadows on his next plan of attack to take out the old gods, to free humanity from their grasp. In combat, he's notable for being one of the opponents with the greatest ability to heal himself, with both the asterisk he can summon and the snake having healing abilities. He will attack with his sword, and every few turns, he will use the Salvation coin flip attack, which will blind the player if failed. Either way the fight goes, the guard ascends to godhood, fulfilling his ambitions and plans, and setting the stage for Fear Hunger 2 Termina. 20. The Gods of the Dep The Gods of the Dep is found in the Cave Dweller Village, near where the Cube of the Depths is found. The God of the Depths serves as a gate to the Gauntlet, the bottommost level of the dungeon. To get access, you'll need to cut the three purple organ bags throughout the dungeon. At a glance, the appearance of the God of the Depths appears to be like a primordial and colossal fish standing upright, with a path leading up to its mouth. But it seems like the design of the God of the Depths has a real-world inspiration. Apparently, the God was inspired by this picture of the sunken USS Saratoga. Here's a few interesting facts about the USS Saratoga, mostly from the Wikipedia article. The USS Saratoga was a Lexington-class aircraft carrier built for the United States Navy during the 1920s. She was converted into one of the Navy's first aircraft carriers. The Saratoga was assigned to the Pacific Fleet for her entire career and for the duration of World War II. In mid-1946, the ship was a target for a nuclear weapons test in Bikini Atoll. So Godzilla connection confirmed, maybe? Anyway. That's the video for today. As always, I appreciate your time. Please don't forget to like, comment, and all that if you'd like to help the video with the algorithm, which I would appreciate. But anyways, thank you very much. Take care, have a good one, and later.